thank you, Bill. And uh, thank you to all of our hosts, Ellen, president of the college. Uh, we've had such a wonderful, thrilling welcome, and I can't tell you how thrilled we are to be back again on campus. I'm thrilled uh, especially, and right at the outset, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of someone who literally altered my life, and that was my biochemistry professor. Uh, sitting in the back right there, Paul Kane. Uh, <laughs> who gave me the epiphany that made me choose my scientific direction. But as you'll see, he gave me some advice that uh, I followed perhaps a little more closely. So Oneont uh, really is the place that shaped my future. It's a place where I received my best advice. And when I was asked to follow money or follow uh, passion, or rather when I asked it, I was told by a young colleague of Dr. Keynes, Walter Nagel, to follow my heart. And I did just that. So imagine I'm back after 35 years to say thank you and to perhaps echo that same advice to the next wave of Oneonta scientists. I'm very honored to be here. <laughs> now, life is not very orderly. Certainly mine has not been. Deciding on a direction to take isn't easy. Most of you in this room are contemplating your life's direction, and I'm afraid I have some bad news. You never stop contemplating your life's direction. Today, I thought I would use my chance at the podium to consider what it takes to be a leader in science or to be a science-based entrepreneur. I don't have to be much of a pundit to predict that many or most of you in this room have the ability to lead science and to follow your passions. I suspect that most of you are already imbued with an entrepreneurial spirit, with a vision of how things might be, with a desire to make it happen. And speaking of direction, I've been known to make a wrong turn or two, though I'm slow to admit it, especially if Judy is in the car. <laughs> but I always had a plan. And here was my first one. The plan needs to be flexible. You need to recognize when you have to change plans and hopefully make a better mistake the next time. So I started with plan A, and in college I might have looked a little different. And uh, plan A was really provoked thanks to some of my friends who were frequent players here at the Hunt Union. <laughs> and thank goodness I did not... St Don't hide your face, Jackie. <laughs> thank goodness I did not stick to that first plan. The rapid evolution of my hairstyle, the faster depreciation of my musical talent, would have limited my career plan to the many uh, fruit fly lifespans we used to have in the bio building. But I had uh, developed a better plan. So what is my best plan ever? And I have to say, this is the plan most consistent in my life. It's been choosing my heroes and choosing my friends wisely. Now, to help me choose my heroes, many years ago, a friend gave me this picture to inspire me. Now, if there ever were heroes, they're here. And I'm sure some of you are beginning to recognize them. This photo was taken in the Fifth Council of Physics in Brussels in 1927. It reveals one of the most impressive collections of science greats ever assembled at one time. 
At the time of the meeting, eight of the 29 people in the group were Nobel Prize winners. Seven more won the prize after the photo was taken. There's Edwin Schrodinger. The next fellow is sometimes hard to find. He's Werner Heisenberg. That's an inside joke. Not many chemists in the group. Uh, Peter Debye, Bragg, Crompton, de Broglie, and the father of the atom at the end. I'll give you a hint. He's a boar. Irving Langmuir down in the lower level. Max Planck, who lots of people thought looked like me. <laughs> Madame Marie Curie, the only woman in the group, and the only person in the group to win two Nobel Prizes. Henrik Lorenz, Uncle Al, <laughs> Charles Wilson, and Sir Owen Richardson. Well, this struck me as a pretty cool assembly, and it tickled my imagination. My perception raced light years ahead of my reality. And you can see where and how. Perhaps. Maybe not. I'll point them out to you. That is. <laughs> see, it does look like me. <laughs> So I thought maybe I'd give science a real go. And in my sophomore year here at Oneonta, I had a remarkable chance I would suggest to anyone else. And that is I took an electron microscopy course at the marine biological laboratories at Woods Hole and Cape Cod. Now that's a place where Nobel Prize winners go to malinger over the summer and they would sometimes step in the course and actually critique our work and you can't imagine the thrill for a sophomore uh, to be meeting people he's only read about and who greet them uh, with kindness and provide advice. And soon after my experience at Woods Hole, Professor Kane and Walter Nagel gave me his advice, go after what I loved. So I married Judy and started graduate school in molecular biology at Stony Brook. Oops. At Stony Brook, I really lucked out in terms of finding heroes. I got to work with two PhD advisors simultaneously. I was more a passive participant, let's face it. But I got to watch the development of one of the first blockbuster drugs to blossom from what was then a very young biotech industry. This is in the very late 70s. My advisor was Barry Kohler, who studied platelet function. And these are the cells that stop you bleeding. And when platelets are activated at a wound, they go through some remarkable physical changes they expand enormously, and along the way, new proteins appear on the surface of the platelets. Barry showed that an antibody made against these new proteins could block the platelet plug from forming. And while these antibodies were really developed to study the esoteric qualities of the protein on the surface of the platelet, it soon became apparent that the antibodies could stop the unhealthy platelet activation that can cause heart attacks and strokes. So imagine my situation, watching what started as an esoteric, pure science study of a new protein on an interesting cell surface, eventually became a therapeutic before my eyes, was licensed to Lilly, sold more than two billion dollars worth of drug a year, saved uncountable lives, and is still today used in more than 250,000 cardiac angioplasties per year. It was a pretty dramatic early inspiration for me. And it came at a time 
when the biotech industry was emerging literally from academia and cracking like an egg. And the current notion of translational research, of finding partners in development that can apply the science coming out of academia, really tracks its roots back to that day. So at first, academic entrepreneurs had to leave academia to translate their science into technology. I went soon after my PhD to England, and it was really against the rules to be an academic in a science department and to fiddle about with a new fledgling company. But today, every academician has to be an entrepreneur. The stories I've listened to from the faculty today shows me more and more they are all imbued with an entrepreneurial spirit, often out of necessity. So in the UK, this keeps skipping, in the UK, my interest turned a little more biophysical to models of biological membranes. Again, I was fortunate. I went to London to study with a fellow of the Royal Society. He was hysterically funny. His name was Dennis Chapman. And uh, beyond his great science, he was an endowed professor at Cambridge as well, and had been previously head of Unilever's Port Sun Lab. So he knew what it was like to live with a leg on both sides of the academia industry fence. He knew something about translating science to technology. Together, uh, we developed a number of interesting models. We looked at membranes as models of polymers and developed polymers that mimicked cell membranes. In fact, we were able to put those monomers into the cells and actually polymerize the cells themselves and make plastic cells that had a much longer lifetime enzymically and could be packed into reactors and uh, used for long-term manufacturing purposes. We developed new devices. We also developed stable models that themselves could come back to academia for the study, for example, of what provokes blood clotting when platelets are activated or when cells are essentially turned inside out. And it led to the filing of all kinds of patents at the University of London. Two decades ago, biotech was still a new frontier with gene jockeys and cowboys of biotech finance. These cowboys move fast, often with less clinical data than we might consider necessary now before risking any money or lives. A decade ago, biotech companies were funded on the basis of promise, not delivery. Consequently, the money chased us in those early days, and we formed a company to develop our membrane memetics. That's changed now. The industry is now driven much more toward income. Income, imagine that. These are some of the products we spawned mimicking biological membranes. We developed a drug delivering cardiac stent. It was one of the first in the industry. And it prevented blood clotting by mimicking the outer red cell surface. We did the same thing with uh, guide wires to be thread into blood vessels. We developed artificial blood vessels and we even developed a contact lens where we could control the quantity of protein adhesion to the lens on the basis of mimicking some of the charge qualities at the surface or the inside surface of biological membranes. That company went public very, very fast became almost a $2 billion company uh, in the first week of its uh, IPO. We viewed another uh, 
fertile topic of membrane chemistry, and that was liposomes, those drug delivery systems. These were a kind of artificial cell in which you could encapsulate a, uh, a drug that might be toxic or a drug that might be cleared from the circulatory system or the reticular endothelial system too fast. And the idea was that the uh, liposome would shield it from that rapid clearance and perhaps get the drug to its target. We also found that we could fool the spleen and the reticular endothelial system with something that was called stealth. And that was using a simple chemical polyethylene glycol, which is now used on many of the proteins that are used therapeutically. It's called pegylation. And the idea is to make the protein or the payload look like water because PEG is so heavily hydroxylated, lots of OH groups just like water, and as it goes through the spleen, it doesn't get recognized and has an opportunity to go through again. But now, all ideas are not great ideas, or all great ideas don't guarantee success. And this was one of my favorites early on, and it was the insertion of cloned human hemoglobin inside an empty liposome to make a universal red cell surrogate that could be infused in those patients who were in the golden hour and had lost an enormous amount of blood. It seemed like a great idea. In fact, it generated an awful lot of attention. We licensed it to DARPA, to the Office of Naval Research, they have spent over a hundred million dollars developing that uh, project. Not one success, despite what a great idea it still sounds like. And by now the original patents have expired. So what does that teach us? What does it tell us about great ideas? What does it teach you about great entrepreneurs. That ideas are a dime a dozen, but empowered entrepreneurs who have the drive and the willingness to work the hours, recruit the people, and share the vision to bring a project to the marketplace, that's much rarer. So I left England to return home to my family, but enamored of a practice I got to see in England that I thought was another terrific idea. And it was called incubation. And in that model, a university startup with roots and connections to the campus and perhaps even technology that's been spun out of the campus is formed in a small startup company, underfunded, not making money, but working in a common environment where a sense of camaraderie develops. Incubators create a learning environment. They create a teachable vision. They're places where champions generate, where ideas crystallize, and where dreams become realized. But they are places where a vertical climb is the standard operating procedure, where hope triumphs over experience. They also allow companies to make better mistakes, to learn from the knowledge base that accrues in a community of entrepreneurs. If you're successful, after the process of emerging from the incubator, with an umbilicus that keeps you somehow attached to the university, which is the environment I love, being in both places at the same time, you end up with a spin-off. If the spin-off is successful, incubation has achieved its goal. It's self-propagating, and you continue to build company upon company. And these are the small businesses upon which America is built. And so I'm a very firm builder, uh, believer in using that as a model. So in fact, I did. 
and use that at Stony Brook University to create our own concept, a corporate incubator, spawning its own companies with crosstalk between many platforms. So we created a platform called the Collaborative Bio Alliance, which was for the cloning of human therapeutic proteins, the refolding and formulation of those therapeutic proteins, and this was at a time before the FDA had approved a multi-drug, multi-user facility. Eventually, the FDA did approve this, and we went from a $5 million backlog of customers who were taking a great risk with us developing their new products, products like troponin and others, to the day the FDA approved it a week later, we had a $200 million backlog of contracts and a serious need to grow in a, in a big hurry. We used our experience in drug delivery to bring new science to the personal care industry because this is much less regulated and it's a fast track to market. So the same scientists working in this group could find outlet in alternative markets. We developed a remarkable fish feed for uh, shrimp and aquaculture. We developed the new Pfizer RID uh, to treat head lice and a variety of other things. We also developed a pharmacogenomic model uh, to design individual products, medicines and skincare products for individual patients. And then finally, we were in the smart gel, hydrogel uh, area that led to the creation of the hyaluronic acid products that are used as surrogates uh, for the meniscus in the knee. Well, uh, this was a little controversial at the time. and uh, Some people thought we should be doing one pure science at a time and uh, avoid any potential uh, crosstalk between cosmetics, let's say, and protein therapeutics. And that was reflected in a genetic and engineering news cartoon which I've always hung on to, which reads, we hope to make antibiotics, interferon, and diagnostic products, but just to be on the safe side, we're starting out with a line of shampoos. Uh, at first it was derisive, <clears throat> but now it's the model that everybody follows. And that model was successful for us. <clears throat> we developed a number of large companies they became attractive to the big players in the world so that our uh, personal care side was acquired by BASF, one of the largest chemical manufacturers. Our therapeutic side was acquired by Dow Chemical. Our pharmacogenomics and hyaluronic acid platforms were acquired by small companies. Uh, so it worked. All of those companies wrote at the interface between science and technology, between academia and industry. But along the way, we learned a few lessons. <laughs> Commercial success is rarely a consequence of pyramidal leadership. Who leads the flock? The flock becomes coherent from a shared vision. It's not from a single strong bird at the leader of the, uh, as the leader of the flock. The challenge for an entrepreneurial spirit is not so much how to lead, but much more importantly, it's how to seed. And believe me, it's hard work. And that hard work is useless without focus and commitment. The leadership is powerless without the community's sanction. And corporate success and staying power are not the achievements of greed. Unfortunately, the banking industry seems to have changed that model. But, but they represent a vote of a community's confidence. 
And that's also why I like the incubation model so much, because you end up part of a tightly knit community. Now, perhaps the most difficult part of commercializing science is working as a group and learning as a cohort. Entrepreneurs are less the embodiment of strong spirits, but their success is a consequence of cloned perception, vision shared, and communities that work in parallel. You don't have to be General Petraeus, Steve Jobs, I said it right, Oprah Winfrey, or Nancy Pelosi. To the contrary, Overbearing leadership can be as overpowering and as inappropriate as jalapeno in a French sauce. You don't put jalapeno in a French sauce, do you? <laughs> Coherence emerges when a vision is shared and multiple leaders within an organization are capable of making that happen. So, all companies sold, everyone's successful, all those companies still persist, by the way, even the one in the UK 25 years later. It's often a measure of success. Now what? <clears throat> plan D, of course. <laughs> you always have to have the next plan and be willing to move it. And the next plan, which is the final bit I'll tell you about, is using DNA to protect brands, consumers, and governments. And this is a public company that we run out of Stony Brook University. And to get the premise, you first have to understand that everything that can be counterfeited will be counterfeited with increasing aggressiveness in shorter periods of time, with better means of duplication, and that will happen worldwide and is happening worldwide. It's putting economies, jobs, and lives at risk. Business Week recently printed the outcome of a Department of Commerce review of the DOD, which said as many as 30% of the microchips used by DOD are substandard or frankly counterfeit. They're substandard because there's a cottage industry in China that removes chips from the computers you throw away that they accept as garbage. They sandblast off the labels, apply new labels, and sell them back to DOD. The space shuttle is known to have counterfeit parts. What are the costs? $250 billion a year to the U.S. economy, 200,000 jobs, $650 billion per year to the global economy. By 2014, that's expected to top a trillion. Counterfeiters copy companies. The NEC company, for example, was uh, copied by an organized consortium of 40 Asian companies. Those 40 Asian companies copied not only the products that NEC sold, their warranties, their packaging, their labels, so well that for five years, NEC warranted the counterfeit product before it was discovered. The other thing that's critical is it used to be thought that counterfeits were sold in the Meuse, the back alleys, the canal streets. They're not. They're now sold on the high street, in the department store. I know of a company, one of the most popular brands from the UK, popular very much in the US, who recognized that they were distributing in their own stores counterfeit brand and developed a security device to mark and indicate their own store. It was copied within two weeks in Guangzhou. And uh, in two weeks, the counterfeit supply was back in their own store. Can you imagine the problem facing the military? Uh, just a couple of examples you see in the marketplace. L'Oreal suing eBay. 
One of the most troubling, in my view, <clears throat> is a morning after pill I was given by Cardinal Drug. This is a single dose pill. It's quite large, bright yellow. It's packaged with two security holograms on each end of the package. It's a very small package. When you take open the package, the pill is made of compressed Epsom salts. That's a foot soak. It's held together with floor wax as a binder to make sure that the pill holds together. But to get the odd, brilliant color, this yellow color, they use a leaded highway paint. Now, this is a product that is meant to terminate pregnancy or to eliminate its possibility when instead, in the first trimester, the uh, poor woman is receiving a dose of lead. Uh, so, counterfeits are worth avoiding. So how do we try to do that? We do it with DNA. We start with a large botanical uh, genomic level piece. Uh, we shake it up, segment it, uh, hydrolyze bits of it, but we encrypt it. We use a process called steganography back from World War II and sneak in codes. We then reassemble it, re-ligate it, embed it, encapsulate it, stabilize it, and do everything we can do to fool the enemy. We also associate it with rapid reporters. Unfortunately, there is no Star Trek tricorder, which means you cannot read DNA sequence in an instant. So we've had to come up with our own tricks, like putting certain indicators covalently associated with DNA, upconverting phosphors, some magnetic tricks, a wide variety of things that are covalently associated with the note. Of course, we have to have stable DNA. So of our 38 patents, a good portion of that is focused on stabilizing the DNA so that the DNA can go through the commercial processes necessary, for example, for fabrics or uh, for the extrusion of plastics or the polymerization of plastics. And we've been able to make DNA very stable so that it can be carried by a host of different carriers. And to my knowledge to date, we have never failed. As a consequence now, we have marked over one billion commercial uh, projects, products. Rapid screening in the field tells us, yes, this is a product that contains an applied DNA DNA marker, but it does not tell us what the sequence is. So we call this a front level or level one screening. Level two screening, all the CSI fans will recognize right away. It's the traditional PCR uh, length polymorphism or sequencing assay that takes a couple of hours in the laboratory. But with that, we are able to offer absolute authentication. Parts can be branded at a molecular level and use that branding to create forensic evidence which is accepted in global courts everywhere. The kinds of applications we look at are passports, currency, ticketing. We've even figured out how to beat the heat of fusion for laser toners when DNA is applied to paper. This will allow us now to track a printed document back to a singular cartridge. Uh, for patient privacy, it's a huge issue. Right now, the penalty uh, in the HIPAA law for an institution which loses track of a hard copy of a patient's record is $50,000. This year, it changed to $1 million. So uh, many institutions are interested in ensuring they can prove they have back their original uh, patient documents. Typical security devices like RFIDs, holograms, can be raised to a forensic level by the inclusion of DNA. Even a barcode, which any of you could copy on a photocopy machine, you can't copy a DNA-encrypted barcode. It won't have the DNA. Security cards, hope you get the tongue-in-cheek. This is for the older crowd. 
on the waterfront. This was actually for the Waterfront Commission of the State of New York. Luxury brands, sneakers, musical instruments. TSA last year lost 1,500 uniforms. It would be nice to be able to ensure that anyone walking on site with a TSA uniform is in fact DNA encrypted. Art, last year, quite ironically, we marked the first stamp ever used on the plant, owned by the Chinese, and uh, have marked that with DNA as well. New products that are counterfeited at a fast rate. And this is perhaps one of uh, the most compelling. This is a project we did for a European multimedia company. They wanted to manufacture 600 million optical discs, DVDs and CDs. But to save money, where would they manufacture them? China, in Guangzhou, the center of counterfeiting. So what they decided to do was to include a family of 12 different security platforms, more security than American currency. Some of those platforms were from Fortune 100 companies, manufactured the 600 two years ago, launched them within nine months. 11 of those 12 security platforms had been counterfeited, and now, two years later, the only way to tell an original optical disk is via the DNA. In the U Europe, we have a contract with the British government to protect the Made in England label. We apply label uh, DNA at every stage of the manufacture, from the crude uh, yar uh, fiber, to the woven yarn, to the finished fabric, to the cut and sewn product, and even to the labels. So we protect it all along the way, and we are the only platform recognized by the European Union. And detection is very straightforward. And the last example uh, I think I'd like to show you is the protection of something everyone can understand, and that is cash. In the UK, and indeed all over Europe, cash transport is done quite differently than here. Here you'd have to be out of your mind to attack a uh, duly wheeled, fully armored, gun ports everywhere, automatic weapon, vehicle with three or four people inside armed to the teeth. But in Europe, there is a sentiment against arms. So the security guards don't carry them. There's also a petrol problem. So they don't have armored trucks. They have minivans. So who transports the money typically is a beer-bellied guard with a motorcycle helmet and $200,000 in boxes side by side. The government has now insisted that those boxes, that transaction not be done in front of the institution they're working with because the risk of terrorism is too high. So instead they have to park a block and a half away and walk that distance carrying that money. Nonetheless, 25% of those guards are assaulted. Some of them shot and the loss uh, is enormous. So we have a method. We put DNA and a dye we developed in with the cash. The cash goes into a box. The box has a GPS in it. It's also got sensitive electronics that the box is messed with or if it goes off its intended path, boom, inside the box is a pyrotechnic. It decorates all of the cash inside with a visible dye, an invisible dye, and DNA. The DNA can then be detected by the police, submitted to us, we mark with multiple DNAs, and we can determine exactly whose cash that was. And every ATM, every cash box has a separate mark so we can track recovered cash to a singular crime. We've been doing that for about 18 months. Actually, we have over 30 cases, 13 of which have gone to conviction with jail times in excess of 100 years already. 
And that's been now adopted by Sweden, and it looks like Switzerland. And needless to say, the uh, police have become great fans. So, as I end up, <laughs> uh, cloning is not necessarily a bad thing, but we're cloning to try to end evil much as we can. And I hope uh, I've shown you some applications that might have been a bit unexpected. And let me leave you with a thought. First of all, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you. I hope I've convinced you that you too have the ability to lead a learning group. And if you think it's hard getting an education, it's even harder keeping one that's relevant. But as Bob Dylan once sang, he not busy being born is busy dying. Good luck in your careers and thank you.